Afghanistan is a country closed for tourists. Since August of 2021, the country has been under the rule of the Taliban terrorist organization. There's been fighting here for more than 40 years. The new government has banned music and girls' education. The people of Afghanistan suffer from poverty, unemployment, and lack of food. At the moment, Afghanistan is sanctioned by the global community. There are almost no foreigners left here. However, I got a chance to visit the capital, Kabul, last August, just a few days before the Taliban captured the city. In this video, I'll show you an Afghanistan still free from the Taliban, with its crowded markets, crazy traffic, clingy children, terrified adults, and the useless army that failed to defend them. I hope you'll appreciate the risk I took to make this extraordinary trip to Afghanistan and like this video. Soon, I'll also release a video about a ghost town in one of the most remote regions of Russia. So subscribe to my channel so you don't miss it. <laughs> Here we are in Kabul. <sighs> There's a sign at the exit of the airport saying that the airport was built with aid from the people of Japan. You see, the Japanese have installed all these solar panels here. It's a really trendy parking spot. You see, it's all powered by solar energy. It's nice that the Afghan people care about the environment, about green energy, about air pollution. That's a step forward. Also, the airport security is said to be provided by the Turkish army. They guard against the Taliban. I better be careful while filming here. Hello. Hey there. Hey, how are you? All good. Guns aren't allowed at the airport, so our guard had to leave his at the gate. On your way out of the airport, you just take your gun and go to the city. <laughs> We're a meter away from the airport and there's already a traffic jam. Uh, the traffic is blocked and uh, some kids are just begging for money. First things first, let me buy a cool costume. A gray one. Yeah, this one. How long will it take to make it? So it'll be ready by lunchtime? Yes. This is the shopping street where you can buy souvenirs, but most of them are made in China. I don't think there's a lot of tourists here. There are some so-called antique shops, but, but judging by how many of these shops there are, I'm assuming a lot of this is made in China too. I find it hard to believe that there are this many antiques preserved here. Hungry yet? About some fresh kebab. He's making a shish kebab here? There's a whole system of blowing air over the coals. So there's just a few coals, but the heat is strong. And this guy's using this fancy hand fan to take the smoke out of the booth. That's Captain Kebab. All six of these men are cooking bread here. Look at the public transport here. So ornate, so beautiful. Good, good. Do, do you speak Russian? Ah, <laughs> oh, so that's how beautiful it is. What are those? Think like public buses. How much is a ticket? 10 Afghani. So they decorate these vans themselves? Yeah, they make them out of motorcycles. Before the 1980s, Afghanistan used to be almost a secular state. The idea was to follow a Western development model. The reforms were initiated by King Mohammad Zahir Shah. He ran the country from 1933 until 1973. He mainly focused on equality, education, and economic development. It's hard to imagine today, but women could walk around bareheaded. 
Afghanistan was a popular destination for foreigners. Teachers and businessmen used to come here, even hippies. But in 1973, there was a coup d'etat, and Mohammed Daoud came to power. He was ruling the country for only six years, but it was during his rule when radical Islamists became more powerful, as well as communists. His presidency ended in 1978, just like peace in Afghanistan. For the next 40 years, the country would almost always be in war. It wasn't safe in Afghanistan for an ordinary tourist to be alone. That's why I hired a translator and a security guard. Moreover, the local police was taking care of foreigner security in Kabul. As soon as we came to the street, some cops approached us and started asking what we're doing here. They seemed really annoyed by us, although it's just a regular residential area. Maybe these are some high security facilities, I don't know. People just seem very agitated. It's hard to film here because they're calling someone now. There are probably cars of important people here, and cameras scare them. What do these policemen want with us? Everything's fine. They're worried about you. About us? So they'll escort us? Uh, actually, we had to notify the local police first. We had to tell them we'd have tourists with us. They're worried for your safety. Okay, so now we got two armed people with us. One's got a walkie-talkie. One group had three armored cars and still got kidnapped. So we can be kidnapped? No, but on the other hand, anything's possible. You know where you've come, right? So now the local police are following us everywhere to protect us while we're within their jurisdiction, because anything can happen. So this is a weird layout for an area. This is the main road with an endless market along this. You can see cars parked here, a couple kids are washing them. The houses themselves are behind barbed wire fences. All houses are guarded. You see they're trading here, bananas, peaches, all the seasonal fruits. My name is Mohamed Isaac. I am from Mazal Sharif. This is Brad. Mm -hmm. And here, they are selling melons and watermelons, right on the sidewalk. While you're here, if you're enjoying the video, share it on Reddit. That way you can help my channel grow. There are a lot of street markets in Kabul where you can find anything. Let me show you the biggest one. There's freshly squeezed juice everywhere here. Here's some orange juice, for example. The color's a little weird, though. Flatbread is deep fried in this amazing, relatively clean oil. It's something like Hot Pockets with nothing inside. Then they're dipped in sauce for some flavor. This is like an Aeron here. Cool. Folks are buying rabbits here. Knife sharpening. This is the most popular bird here, Chukar partridge. It has a red beak and black stripes. Afghans find it very cute. People keep rabbits, parrots, and pigeons at home as pets. Most of these birds are farmed. Some are caught in the wild and some are even brought here from abroad. So you can choose a bird that matches your taste. We're at the market now. It's really noisy here. There are several loudspeakers in the background and people are trying to speak louder than the speakers to be heard. We got quite the selection here. Hooves, stomachs, heads, and fruits right next to them. It's all outside, in the heat, with flies. And people still manage to find something tasty here. Just 10 meters away from here, there's a bridge with a bunch of junkies. 
here normal life is going on, people are selling fruits and stuff, and over there people are just rotting below. In fact, Afghanistan is the largest producer of opium. It accounts for 85% of the world production. Most of the opium is exported, of course, but a part of it is consumed domestically. Afghanistan has the lowest price on heroin in the world. Unfortunately, a lot of people start doing it when they hit hard times and they become addicted. What a scary place. We didn't have to go far to find an example. Here's a vendor for sheep's heads. And here guys are doing drugs right behind him. They use tinfoil right at the marketplace. Obviously, it's super easy to find someone who's going to sell you heroin here. There's a bridge on the outskirts of Kabul. There are several waste pipes running through here. It's hard to tell what kind of waste it is, but it really stinks. And dozens or even hundreds of junkies are under the bridge. A dose costs around $7 here. Some people come here to take a dose and then go on with their lives. Others stay here for days or even weeks rotting down there. Anyone who climbs down there does so to take heroin. There are no random visitors. Hundreds of people are laying there on carpets. You can hear constant lighter clicks. Those are glass pipes where they heat their poison with a lighter and smoke it. It's one of the scariest places I've ever seen. You see all these people and you realize that some of them will never leave this place again. Some of them are wearing headlamps. I don't know if you can see. This really is just sewage. And some guy's washing his fruit in this water. You speak English? They're getting nervous and telling me to stop filming. My tour guide's getting nervous too. Does the police arrest junkies here when they're doing this in the streets? Does the police arrest alcoholics in Russia? No, same here. It used to be clean here. There was grass and the water was blue. Yeah, it used to be. What happened? They started dumping trash here? Sellers who work nearby, yeah. They just throw their trash here? Yeah, yeah. You see, those are all junkies. There? Oh, yeah, I see it. These addicts have these kind of caves on the waterfront. It's where they do their drugs, mainly heroin. Another option is when two people hide under a cover so that the wind doesn't blow out the flame of their lighter. They just heat this poison in a glass pipe and then they inhale it. Damn, they walk like zombies. Junkies hang around there, and here it just smells like a toilet. They're sitting in small groups in some holes. They wash themselves in this water. It's the same water they in. That's crazy. <laughs> it looks like that dog is just eating somebody. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised if they fed a junkie to a dog. People use this waterfront as a toilet. You can see a man behind my back. Uh, he, he's about to take a dump. And you can tell by the smell that he's not the only person to do that here. This place is pretty central. We're only a kilometer away from the main square with ministries and the best hotel of the city. There are mosques around here. This is the main river and, and basically a waterfront. Used to be clean, green, and nice. Well-dressed people used to walk along the river. Today there are beggars, there's trash, people defecate here, and the water looks like used motor oil. And in the middle of all this waste and black water, they're just groups of junkies. It's a terrible view. Oh, it's pretty foul here. Hey, did he come to take a shit also? There's no bathroom nearby, or why else did he come here? Oh, there is. But he prefers this place. 
Oh, now he's embarrassed. I get it. So there are normal bathrooms, but he just prefers this spot. This is a city center, right in the center. At least it's free. I see. Oh, what a mess. Here's another checkpoint. Some carts, barbed wire, beggars, repair shops, bicycles, stray dogs, an endless market all over again. Yeah, this looks unreal. That's what analog traffic lights look like in Kabul. Regular lights don't seem to work, so there's a person closing this gate when cars can't go. If not for this gate, all the cars would go at once and there would be a traffic jam. Nobody in Kabul respects the rules of the road. Cars go on the opposite lane, on the side of the road, on the sidewalks. If there's no concrete blocks or fence, a car will go there. Oh, he's opening the gate for us. In terms of traffic, Kabul can be compared to the biggest African capitals because I've never seen such a messy road traffic. By the way, I haven't seen a single working traffic light. Are there any? There are? They're telling me there is a working light, we just haven't come across it yet. So, we came across a hundred heroin addicts, security guards, soldiers, a, a policemen with all sorts of weapons and military equipment, but not a single working traffic light. What a miracle. Where's the working light? They promised me we'll find it, but I don't believe them. I don't think there are working traffic lights in Kabul. Some time ago, there was a trolley bus in Kabul. It was built by Czechoslovakia. The service launched in 1979. Here's the picture of the first trolley bus presentation. Later on, Afghans built some more routes of their own, but the electric contact network was reportedly in bad condition. So locals didn't like this means of transport much. The last trolley bus came to a halt in 1992. Today there are no trolley buses. Now public transport includes vans, some weird buses, taxis, and whatever vehicle people can find. Besides the bridge and markets, the drug addicts of Kabul also like to gather at cemeteries. As I've already said, drugs are super affordable here. Heroin costs nothing. It's very common here to do drugs. They do it everywhere. In the streets, in the center, on the waterfront, under bridges, or here at the cemetery in the outskirts of Kabul. Dozens, no, hundreds of addicts are sitting at the graves doing heroin. Oh, just look at how many of them there are. Just look at these hundreds of people sitting among the gravestones. All of them are heroin addicts. They all do drugs. They get very aggressive when they see cameras, so we're not going to go any closer. And as well, you never know what to expect from somebody that's high. But this really looks unbelievable. Shoot. Okay. Understand? Okay. Yeah. Don't shoot that picture, our, our picture. Why? Because uh, they, they don't like the, the picture. Who is this people? All is cooking the uh, snack. Hmm? Heroin, you know? Heroin. Heroin, heroin, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's smoking. Yeah. You also? You yeah, smoke I, heroin? I also, yeah. Why? Why you do this? What's the reason? I, 40 years ago, I smoked. You smoked heroin for 40 years? 40 years, yeah. Wow. Not How? wow, what wow? <laughs> <laughs> so this is heroin, right? Heroin. Heroin. All right, so this huge cemetery, and it's hard to count, but there's hundreds of drug addicts at the graves. As you see, Heroin is easily accessible. It costs almost nothing. Even foreigners come here for drug tourism. And they often stay here for good. They stay here and they die here. How fitting. These junkies gather here at an old cemetery right at the graves. No need to go anywhere once they die. Yeah, please remember that drugs are evil. Afghanistan is the best representation of this. Just see what's become of people who've just tried it once. The people of Afghanistan have been living in a war zone for several decades now. In 1978, the so-called April Revolution took place. 
It was started by the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, or PDPA. As a result, the government and the president were overthrown. The PDPA took all the power into their hands. Members of the party wanted to make Afghanistan a socialist country. They started imposing laws alien to the mentality of the local people aimed at fighting Islam. Mujahideen, armed Islamist rebel groups, were fighting against the socialists. The ruling party asked their friends from the USSR to help, and shortly after, the Soviet army entered Afghanistan. Soon, PDPA allies took the presidential palace. They got rid of the head of state and appointed a new one. They stayed there to help fighting radical Islamist groups. It was a time of the Cold War between the USA and the Soviet Union. That's why Washington decided to get involved in the situation in Afghanistan. That's when the American government spent dozens of billions of dollars to arm the Mujahideen who were fighting against the USSR. Islamist militants used modern American arms to shoot Soviet planes. In 1987, the USSR was getting prepared to withdraw the troops from Afghanistan, and after two years, the Soviet army officially left the country. Anywhere from between 500,000 and 2 million Afghans were said to have been killed during the 10 years of this conflict. More than 5 million people have fled the country. Decades of conflict affected nearly everyone. Some lost their relatives, others became disabled. More than half the population suffer from psychological traumas. According to the National Mental Health Survey, over 66% of Afghans have personally experienced at least one traumatic event. After the Soviet Union left Afghanistan, civil war kept on going. Political groups were in power one after another. In this conflict, the Taliban movement emerged in Afghanistan in 1994. At first, it mainly consisted of refugees who returned to the country after getting religious education in neighboring Pakistan. In 1996, the Taliban managed to take over Kabul and basically began to control the whole country. Violent fighting for power stopped. But the country was in poverty, in crisis, and the Taliban was extremely violent with those who were discontented with the new order. They were beheaded or stoned to death. Behind me, you can see Ghazi Stadium. It fits 25,000 people, and it's quite notorious because when the Taliban controlled the city of Kabul, there were no soccer games on Friday nights here. There were executions and public punishments. It was reopened after renovation in 2011, but a lot of Kabul residents still try to avoid this place, since they believe the souls of the victims still roam around here. It's a very unpleasant place. People say that there was so much blood spilled on the field that the first attempts to grow grass here failed. Now it's closed, we can't get inside, but look at these old columns with bullet marks all over them. The Taliban is especially harsh on women. During the first Taliban takeover, they weren't allowed to work, to study, or even to leave the home without a male family member. Now the Taliban keeps limiting women's rights. To all the past restrictions, they've added a ban for women to visit parks, to participate in entertaining TV shows, and practice playing sports. Women are not allowed to walk around without a hijab. Although I can't say women were particularly respected before the Taliban came to power. At this spot, on the 19th of March 2015, Farkunda Malikzada was murdered. She worked at a mosque near here. She got into a fight with the mullah of the mosque. She confronted him about his practice of selling amulets at the mosque or something. And apparently, the mullah got worried for his career because of the things she said. And he was trafficking in amulets or something like Viagra, something not related to the religion at all. To defend himself, he loudly accused her of burning the Quran. It caused immediate reaction. People burst with anger. Later, an investigation found that she, of course, hadn't burned the Quran. The mullah made the story up just to defend himself and set the woman up. A lot of people gathered and attacked her. She was violently beaten. The police attempted to protect her, lead her to a local precinct, but the crowd was too big. They fired warning shots into the air. Police moved her into the mosque. They hoisted her onto the roof in an attempt to rescue her from the crowd. The roof must have been sloppy because she slipped and fell into the crowd that beat her to death. Then they brought her here along the waterfront. They burnt her here and threw her into the river. The following day, many religious and community leaders expressed their support to the crowd. They said the woman was guilty. There was a version of this story that she had provoked this scene on purpose to get asylum in America. But she was found innocent later. She was framed. She was a victim of unreasonable aggression. Forty-nine people were arrested following this case. 
three men were sentenced to death, but received 20-year prison sentences instead. Including the mullah, he was sentenced to 20 years. 19 police officers received prison terms for failing to protect her. What a horrible story. This story drew attention to women's rights. Here's a memorial of a fist. A lot of women in Afghanistan were outraged. There were women's protests, women's marches. Protesters wore a mask of Farkunda's face covered in blood. This story shows us how hot-headed people can be here. Every wrong word can bring about serious outcomes. That's why everyone here is so worried for us. The situation's dangerous. I don't go out much. I, I barely leave home alone. Only with my husband. When we take a car, when we go to a wedding, to a friend's house. I don't just go out for a walk. No. I'm not scared of anything. Well, just pickpockets. Homeless boys steal things like this. My handbag was cut once. Also, my son attends school here. I'm worried for him, too. What if they kidnap him because he's Russian? Those who are a bit wealthier than average, they're at risk. Sometimes kids get kidnapped and kidnappers ask for money. This is scary. Zyra was right. I met a lot of child beggars on the streets of Kabul. They annoyed us as much as they could and they weren't even scared of our guard with a rifle. Here we are in a so-called old town. You can see colorful houses on the hills in the background. Looks a bit like the favelas in Brazil. Here comes some police. Oh, there's a candy seller. And some kids. Oh, the kids are everywhere. So, since there's not a lot to do here, uh, a foreigner in the old town, in a poorer neighborhood, is a, a really big deal. Children run to see what's going on here. I have to say that people here are very peaceful. They don't mind pictures. There's no anger here, just some cautious curiosity. Look, it's condensed milk over there. Our Russian condensed milk. The adults here are, uh, uh, pushing the kids away from me. Because they, they think I'm annoyed by it. Oh, they're making tea here. Amazing! Some fresh bread. Watch your phone. Why, are they gonna steal it? Yeah. There are more and more kids here, man. Look, it's becoming a problem. <laughs> Look at this amazing ride. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> they don't listen to me. <laughs> there are so many kids here, it's becoming an issue. Uh, firstly, because kids steal stuff. They try to pick your pockets. Secondly, when there's so many of them, they misbehave. They start throwing something, stuff like that. Adults know about it, so they're trying to send them away, but that doesn't work, because they're kids. They throw fruit, corn seeds, stuff like that. Yeah, they don't give a damn about the adults. Well, about what the adults tell them anyway. Even our friend with a gun doesn't intimidate them. <laughs> These children going around with the bags, are they orphans? Do they have parents? Some children's parents are dead. I don't know for sure. Can you ask if his parents are alive? Yes, his parents paint shoes. Oh, okay. They, they paint shoes while their kids are begging in the streets? Yeah. How much does he make a day from begging? Around 150 Afghani a day. To feed himself, right? Yeah, sure. What else are they going to do? If not begging, they'd be stealing. Ну, 
Oh, we got ourselves into an adventure here. Some guy left his car like this and just blocked us. He didn't leave a phone number, so we can't reach or find him. So another guy with a tire iron, he's now breaking into the car. This is what happens if you show them that you can give them money. So, they want more, yes. Meanwhile, in the countryside, I met kids wearing gorgeous traditional dresses. Girls are dressed so nicely. These are ordinary rural people, she's a shepherdess. They're wearing these beautiful dresses. Look how beautiful these kids are. How are you? <laughs> oh, I see. These children are amazing. We're in a village in the suburbs of Kabul. People here are very poor and these kids are herding sheep, but they're not dressed in rags. Boys are wearing traditional Afghan clothes, long shirts and trousers, while girls are wearing fancy dresses. These dresses are decorated with beads and glitter, so fancy. I wanted to ask him how it feels to be wearing black in this heat, until I realized I'm wearing black too. When the Taliban came to power in 1996, Western countries were silently judging local customs, but didn't do anything about it. When the Taliban was implementing its changes within the country and didn't seek to conquer new areas, world leaders stayed silent. That was until the terror attack on September 11th. The Taliban refused to hand over al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden to the states. America launched a military campaign against the Taliban in October of 2001. The Taliban regime was overthrown by December of 2001. Guerrilla war broke out, and American troops got stuck there for 20 years. In 2011, the American presence in Afghanistan started to decline. From 2014, American soldiers stopped taking part in land battles. For the next seven years, U.S. military were supporting the Afghan army, using airstrikes to fight terrorists. At the beginning of 2021, President Biden announced that all troops were planned to be withdrawn by September 11th the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. After this news, the Taliban started a military offensive. It only took them four months to take power. On August 15th, Taliban forces took control of Kabul. I was in Kabul a few days before they arrived here. I wanted to go outside the city and look at how people lived in the rural areas, but I couldn't do it due to the battles at the entrance to the capital. So, we have some trouble following our plan. We were supposed to go to Panchir today. It's 150 kilometers away. But the situation with the Taliban changed overnight. They are said to have captured some towns on the way there, so now the road isn't controlled. Drivers and all the groups with us refuse to go there, as it's unsafe. I insisted. I said that it would be my sole responsibility. We have to go outside the city to see what's going on. Everybody refuses, although that's what we initially agreed on. I paid for a bulletproof land cruiser, you see. It costs $800 a day. The car is completely armored. We agreed we'd take a bodyguard, an armored car, but we would go and we would take this road at my risk. But something happened overnight, they read some news or received a call, they flat out refused. Our Russian translator ran away. He said he didn't want all that fuss. We were supposed to meet at 7 a.m., but he didn't show up. Only at 9 were we told that he wasn't showing up and he turned off his phone. Eventually we found another guy. He speaks English. He's sitting back there. I told him we had to leave the city. He was like, okay, but not far. All right, guys, let's have a look at the provinces. First of all, there's a lot of fortifications. Now, I don't know what those fortresses are along the road. After every one or two kilometers, you can also see those sandbags. I don't know what they're there for. Maybe these are pillboxes to rebuff Taliban attacks? There are a lot of fort-like structures here, but they're all empty. I don't see any heavy armor, nothing. We only saw two hammers during the whole trip and they didn't seem to be working. 
You see occasional armed guys, but there are no heavy weapons. Nothing. No equipment to block the road. Nothing. And now you can see why the Taliban's taken this country so fast. Hi. Hi. How are you? Fine, thanks. What are you doing? Hmm? What are you doing here? We are traveling. We just uh, want to know what, what's going on in uh, Afghanistan right now uh, about the situation. That's why it's interesting to talk also with you guys. And if you can explain what, what's going on, it will be great. To under, just only to understand you, the situation yeah. here. Do you know about security of Afghanistan? No. Why? <laughs> what do you mean? Why are you in Afghanistan during these times? <laughs> no tourists, low season. <laughs> so it's not allowed to film. I really thought they would notice our action camera on our shoulders with a flashing red light. I, I was sure we were going to jail, but, but can you imagine how careless they are? A guy asked us, will you pay for the interviews? If you pay, you can film everything. You know how much they wanted? For how much they were ready to sell the checkpoint, their faces, everything. $27. Even though this is the main checkpoint at the city entrance. If we had any bad intentions, of course we don't, but if we had, we could use this against them. I've never seen such a careless military. Uh, because of the security situation, mm -hmm. we cannot go forward. And we receive, uh, as we talked for today, uh, for, because of the security situation, you know, yes? Mm -hmm. Because of that, we cannot go forward. Okay. And what is this place? It's a city or...? This, this is a district of uh, Kabul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, 10 kilometers from here. Yeah. Why, uh, if Taliban uh, is close to Kabul, and as, as you say, they're 10 kilometers from here, mm -hmm. why there is no uh, army? On that place that I yeah. already show you the maps, mm -hmm. uh, their army, there is army people. Uh, they are trying to get uh, these places uh, and take them out from the control of the Taliban right now. Uh, and the war is right now continues in that places. Mm -hmm. And we can't go there? Yeah, we cannot go there. What can happen if we'll do? <laughs> they kill us. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, for example, if you'll take taxi no, what, and, and go there. If you take a taxi? Yes, without how, you. How you can live on the ride of the taxi, these people that ride the taxi? You can't believe that people. Why? Why can't believe them? Because they are common people. Mm -hmm. Maybe the situation is right now like that, that you cannot believe anyone. Maybe those people that they are riding taxi uh, within the Kabul. Mm. Maybe they are one of the people who work with the Taliban. Mm. Yeah. And many people w work with Taliban? If you guess, if you guess, maybe they can enter to the Kabul. Mm. Because you see the main gates of the Kabul mm -hmm. that you see enter the city. Uh, they are not that much secure. They, they are not that much uh, good. They didn't have that much. They can't visit the people when they are uh, mm -hmm. Entered to the city of Kabul. President Ashraf Ghani was one of the first to leave Afghanistan. And the Russian embassy reports that he tried to take bags of cash on board with him, but it didn't fit, so some money was just left on the runway. Later, Ghani denied everything, saying he didn't bring anything on board. The ex president of Afghanistan was last seen in the United Arab Emirates. Since then, his location is unknown. The closer the Taliban was to Kabul, the more people panicked. Afghans stormed Kabul's airport in a desperate bid to escape the new regime. They had no other option to flee the country. I myself was lucky to get on a flight home just a couple of days before the Taliban took over the capital, and only on my second try. After I already left Afghanistan, I saw a video online where some Afghans clung to the side of a departing military jet as it rolled down the tarmac and fell down. One more thing, you can see our guard in the back seat. We were advised to hire him. He's more like an armed man who's unlikely to save us from a seizure. Yeah, he looks threatening, but of course, he won't get into a fight for you. He's just there to ward off junkies and beggars. 
The people here might be aggressive, so seeing an armed man calms them down a bit. So it's easier to get around. And here is an interpreter from the local language to English. Yesterday when we were at the market, we noticed a guy secretly filming our bodyguard and interpreter. What was that? That might have been a Taliban supporter, keeping a record of locals who work with foreigners in order to execute them later. There are plenty of stories of the Taliban killing or kidnapping journalists and interpreters, people who used to work with Americans when Americans were here. This is not good, because these agents are everywhere. It's another reason why people refuse to go to Taliban-controlled areas with us. It seems to be more of a threat to those behind me than to myself. As you know, there are problems with security in Afghanistan now. That's why we were worried for our lives, for our families. But we're doing what we can to live and work in our country. Is there any, any problems? Uh, they said uh, the problem is in security. Yeah. So they can't work. And But for local people, yeah. is there a difference between government and uh, Taliban? They would prefer to keep living like they're living now, under the official government. They hope the Taliban doesn't come here. While I was in Kabul, a lot of refugees from other areas of the country that were already under the Taliban were coming to the capital. Since a major part of the country is in war and the Taliban is coming, people flee Taliban rule and come to the capital, to Kabul. So at the northern city gate, there's this huge sort of refugee camp. There are some constructions, other people live right in the street. They've just arrived. Nothing is organized here yet. Let's see how they live here. How did they get to Kabul? The government has asked the people in Kunduz province to leave as soon as possible, in order to save our stuff and our lives from the airstrikes that were about to begin. That's why we migrated. How did you get here? By car? Yeah, we rented a car for 2,500 Afghani to come here. So you came because of bombing? Yes. A lot of people came back thinking there was hope for a better future. Now they regret it. Where did you return from? I returned long ago. I used to live in Russia. I'm talking about others who came back from Iran, from Pakistan. This is the situation here. People come here from all over Afghanistan, by car, by bus, and there are no facilities, no organization. They stay on the ground, on some carpets, some blankets. They try to survive here. Nobody's helping, just some rare cars might bring lunch to them. They distribute bread here, but as I got it, those are non-governmental organizations. Local people are helping. Every day there are more and more of them. While the Taliban is getting closer, people are rashing here, to the border of Kabul. What's the government doing? Why aren't they helping? They must not have the resources, that's why they're not helping. They must not have the resources. We are at a refugee camp. Ordinary people come here to bring food. You see them handing out powdered baby milk. The man in the blue robe is the head of the agency that provides a car and security to us. Our initial plan for this trip didn't work out. We couldn't go here, we couldn't go there. So we texted him about it. And he seemed so stressed answering to us. He said, I dropped everything to come here because people are starving. There are so many refugees, I have to feed them all. So he left his job, his whole business basically. Well, he probably realizes there will be no business soon. He's bought a cart of baby formula with his own money and he's trying to distribute it fairly right now without any fights or crushes. It's hard though, the crowd is huge, people are lining up. Nobody's helping, there are only volunteers here supporting the refugees. These people are left to their fate here. No one helps them, some occasional NGOs. Look, look! What's going on? Okay. Some occasional NGOs may bring food or something, but it's not enough for everyone. People get into fights for food supplies. What's going on? I am a migrant. I'm suffering. Why aren't you helping me? We lost our jobs. Nobody's helping us. Lady, please leave. Don't make so much noise. I'm not going anywhere. You have to help me. This is my right. I'm assisting a foreign journalist. I'm just a bodyguard. What was the problem? Why was she screaming? The problem is that the government doesn't help. She saw him wearing a military uniform. Oh, she asked for help? She said they're suffering. People are stressed. Of course they're stressed. Nobody's helping them. 
Nobody cares about them, and here they saw my bodyguard wearing a uniform, and he became the target of their aggression. What did she want from us? Help. She wanted help. Help? Then why was she screaming and trying to hit us? They didn't give anything to them. All they can do is sit around. Ordinary people counted on the state army that had been receiving help from the U.S. all this time. But judging from what I saw, and from how fast the Taliban captured the whole country, the state army of Afghanistan turned out to be a bunch of unmotivated, unequipped, underpaid soldiers. I was here 10 years ago and it looked pretty similar. There's no visible fortifications here. It looks like a peaceful daily life to me. By the way, there are plenty of armed people in the city, but it's unclear what military units they belong to. It's hard to tell police from armed security or soldiers. Even National Army soldiers sometimes wear random uniforms, like ones they buy at the market. It's quite common here. Soldiers can wear various kinds of uniforms, so do security guards. Maybe there won't be stars and shoulder marks. There are so many people wearing military uniforms here, so it's a bit hard to navigate among them. He's showing his Kalashnikov to us? We can film the gear, but not the face. It's American. American? Yeah, yeah, America. American sunglasses. It's actually from Pakistan. <laughs> Afghan soldiers aren't ready to risk their lives for such little pay. It often happens that commanders take the salary from soldiers. You want to be a soldier? Pay. Moreover, conditions of service are terrible. Most importantly, they don't understand what they should die for. And a majority of soldiers, those who come from rural areas, they support the Taliban. You think they don't? They do. They share Taliban values. Sharia law is good. It's fair law. For many, armed Taliban fighters is a symbol of order and justice. In spite of American trainings, uniform, all the investments, the Afghan army is a useless crowd. The American troops took all the weapons and military equipment with them when they were leaving Afghanistan. There were only empty military bases left. From this side of the wall, there's a livestock market. From the other, it's a former American military base. They left it several months ago. Now the National Army of Afghanistan has taken over the base. There's a kind of fortress up there. When Americans left, did they take all the military equipment with them? Uh, I'm not sure about this place. But at Bagram, they burnt down or destroyed everything. There were videos where the Taliban goes through the U.S. military equipment. No, no, they even took empty containers with them. So they handed over an empty base? Yes, if I'm not mistaken, it's just one hospital left in Bagram and a couple of cars. Normal cars, not armored. They even burnt their trash before leaving the base. Wow. A strange situation here. We came to a hill to get a better view of Amin's palace, and there are soldiers on each hill. But you'll never know they're soldiers because they're not wearing uniforms. They're sleeping here on carpets with their rifles in hand. And they're very strange. You know how soldiers usually say, no cameras, leave. Here they say, you can't film us, but you can hang out with us here if you want. Even if you take our picture, no problem. Here they are. So they're not strict here. Just don't put your camera in their face. But you see the current condition of the Afghan army. Afghan soldiers are people sleeping on a hill with their rifles in hand. It's really strange. Okay, that's exactly how that was supposed to end. But careful. A military guy came and said, are you guys crazy? Do you realize you're recording all our firing points, military bases, equipment, walls, fortifications? We're in war here. And you're just filming whatever you want. Are you out of your mind? So we said sorry and left. And we weren't even detained. It's the first time I see military being so patient with cameras and journalists. So they understand that it's not okay to film here. They know it should stay confidential, but they're like, okay, whatever. And the guys were wearing casual t-shirts. I asked if we could take a picture together. 
well, yeah, but we're not wearing uniform. It won't look cool. In general, everything is really chill. In any other country, our cameras would be taken away and we'd be going to jail right now. Total recklessness. But everyone here is relaxed, almost like it's some children's party. Nobody cares about the environment here. As you see, guys, nobody cares about sustainability here. Rubbish, plastic, human waste, wool from the sheep, and other shit is thrown into this stream. Some rivers and streams in Kabul look like landfills. It looks like the bottom is solid, so it may seem like a landfill. Nope, you can see water over there. It's black. And it's trying to flow here. This is actually a stream. It's hard to believe, but it is. The smell is awful here. It's okay to foul rivers here, I guess. There's a livestock market right next to this wonderful Black River. Let's have a look. Look how Afghans paint their rams in this designer way. It's not just a boring ear tag. It's a stylish design. It's a super stylish ram. In Russia, it's teenagers who color their hair like this. Here, it's sheep. Here's a fuchsia-colored ass. Here are some green circles. It means that the owner is very trendy, a fashion fan. If he can't dress trendy himself, his flock can. So a little bit about this wonderful place. It's a small roadside cafe with an amazing background. There are cages with fighting partridges here. Some of these birds may be worth up to 2,000 USD. These are fighting partridges. There's a small room right behind me where the owner of the cafe cuts meat right on the floor. On one hand, Afghans think it's really cute, this chukar partridge. On the other hand, it can participate in bird fights. There's its friend there, it's a little bigger. It has a red beak and white stripes on its wings. They participate in fights and cost a lot. You see, it's ready to attack me. The top birds may cost 2,000 USD. This shukar partridge costs 400 USD. It's a true killing machine. Its face is full of anger, looks like a real thug. The best ones are sold at 2,000 USD. We're now at the Kabul Zoo. It was opened in 1967. It was quite huge, but you know my opinion about zoos. Kind of knackeries. Of course, the Kabul Zoo is no exception. A lot of animals have been suffering here, have been abused. There's a bronze statue of a lion called Marjan. He was living here for 22 years. Throughout all those years, he was mistreated and abused. He was one-eyed and his statue lacks an eye too. So he was blind in one eye, he was injured several times during bombings, as civil war has been going on for the last 40 years. Sometimes the zoo becomes the target of a bombing. He wasn't the only one who suffered here. For example, an elephant was torn to pieces by a rocket in 1994. A year later, a Siberian tiger was killed by grenade shrapnel. Zoo visitors here aren't exactly civilized. They sometimes abuse animals. It's a rather scary place. People still come here to look at the animals, but those aren't really educated people. It's not allowed to come inside with cigarettes and matches because some visitors find it funny to feed animals cigarettes. There's actually a special box at the entrance where people can leave their cigarettes, lighters, and matches. Look at this tiny monkey cage. There are around 10 monkeys in here. It's a great representation of zoo conditions that animals live in, like a maximum security prison. Two perimeters, endless security bars. Free animals stay in those cages wondering what's going on. People come and throw stuff at them, take pictures of them. Kids come to look at these poor animals. As well, a lot of people come to the zoo just to chill a bit. There are hardly any public spaces in Kabul. No parks, no gardens. You can't just sit and relax in a nice green spot, because the city is messed up. It's very busy, there are markets everywhere, it stinks. A lot of people come, pay 20, 30 Afghani for the entry, and just sit under a tree with their families. They're not here for the animals. The zoo is like this kind of public space for them. This is that unsophisticated local fast food. They eat rice, beans and some sauce, bread, onion, 
and liver for those who can afford it. He's making liver with some carrots in this large cooking pot. Looks delicious. Otherwise, rice, beans, onion, tea. Now let's have lunch at an authentic Kabulian restaurant. You can see from here that the place is fancy. They forbid filming. They don't want us to film here, but there are animal carcasses hanging there as decoration. Also, you can see that everything is fresh here. All right, we can film now. They agreed to it. People sit on covered chairs while eating. In cheaper places, people eat right on the floor. So this one's of a higher class. You can wash your hands here, a napkin, No one knows how long the Taliban regime will last. The new government is divided. People in power are uneducated and don't know how to rule a country. Ordinary people suffer from poverty, shortages, and violent laws. Without foreign investments, the country's economy went into decline. I hope one day I'll be able to see Afghanistan free and bright, like I remember it from August of 2021. If you like this video, share it on Reddit and don't forget to subscribe to my channel.